Good morning. We have general questions. Question one, Alice McInnes. Thank you very much, Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government under what circumstances it considers it appropriate for a guardianship order to be granted. Mr Paul Wheelhouse. Uh, the Adults with Incapacity Scotland Act 2000 put in place a range of measures to make provision for the personal welfare and or financial affairs of adults who are incapable by reason of mental disorder or inability to communicate of managing their own affairs. An application for a guardianship order can be made to the Sheriff Court by an individual or by the local authority where no one else is applying and the adult has been assessed as requiring a guardian. The need for guardianship has, been demonstrated by the applicant, has to be demonstrated by the applicant and is governed by the grounds set out in the 2000 Act. Arrangements for making applications are set out in sections 57 and 58 to the 2000 Act. It is for the Sheriff to determine whether and in what circumstances a guardianship order should be granted. Guardianship orders can cover financial matters and or welfare matters. An order is likely to be suitable where a person of 16 years or over lacks capacity or has never had capacity to take decisions or actions on these matters for him or herself. It allows another person with an interest in the adult, such as a family member, to have authority to act and make decisions on their behalf. Alice McInnes. Thank the Minister for that reply. Monitoring by the Mental Welfare Commission has revealed that the number of successful new applications has risen by 58 per cent since 2008-9, and orders are increasingly being used for adults with learning disabilities. Campaigners such as People First are concerned that some people with learning disabilities are having control over their life removed when it would be more appropriate to support them to make the decisions they are capable of. Given that it's 15 years since the Adults with Incapacity Act was passed, does the government believe it would be appropriate to review the law and practice on guardianship orders to ensure that their use is consistent, justified and that individual autonomy is being upheld as called for by Scotland's National Action Plan for Human Rights? Minister. Well, I certainly recognise the point Alison McInnes has made about uh, learning disabilities, and I, I certainly would put on record that the provisions of the Act uh, obviously do apply to those who have lost capacity to make their own decisions or have never had the capacity, as I said in my opening answer. Uh, there is no strict list of categories of people who, to whom it applies, but legislation recognises that decision-making is not an all or nothing and that uh, capacity may fluctuate. Um, adults who have some form of learning disability may, of course, be able to take uh, and make some decisions for themselves and should be supported in doing so where uh, that is possible. And the requirements of each individual will vary and where guardianship is appropriate, the order can be tailored to the needs of that individual. I'm happy to discuss with Alison McInnes if she has any specific ideas around this issue because I'm conscious that it is something that is uh, increasingly important in, uh, in the modern era and um, that uh, certainly we encourage people to look at the matters very closely to see what is suitable for their relative and make sure the appropriate arrangements are in place. I'm happy to meet Alison to, to discuss that. Question two, Margaret Mitchell. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government when the various phases of the Transport Scotland Wraith Junction improvement works are due for completion. Cabinet Secretary Keith Brown. Uh, the improvement works at Wraith Interchange have been taken forward as part of the M8, M73, M74 motorway improvements NPD contract. The overall construction work on the contract remains on course for completion as planned in spring 2017. Margaret Mitchell. Thank you. I'm disappointed the um, Cabinet Secretary isn't uh, able to give more specific um, dates for the various completions. However, is he aware that residents living close to the proximity of this uh, construction site expected disruption and therefore negotiated a generous working pattern being given, uh, beginning 6.30 in the morning and ending at 11 p.m. at night. This has been breached on one occasion, resulting in sleepless nights for these residents. And the residents have now been told that from the 20th of March, 24-7 working is due to recommence with the pounding of heavy machinery, intrusive floodlights and all that entails. Does the Cabinet Secretary think this is reasonable? And if not, can he intervene? Cabinet Secretary. First of all, I'm not sure why Margaret Mitchell should be disappointed about the answer I gave. I've said that the project is due to be completed in spring 2017. There is no phasing. There, is no, there was no timetable by, by which different phases were, would be completed in relation to this contract, as has sometimes been the case in other contracts. So that's not changed. Uh, if it is the case, though, as, as uh, Margaret Mitchell said, that there have been an agreement and that agreement has been breached, then of course I would be concerned about that. We'd be happy to look into that. And if the member wants to write to me with more uh, detailed information, I would undertake to look into that on her behalf. Question three, Bob Doris. To ask the Scottish Government when it last met Glasgow City Council to discuss how it is taking forward the childcare commitment for eligible two-year-olds and all three and four-year-olds. Cabinet Secretary Angela Constance. 
Presiding officer, the Scottish Government officials and Glasgow City Council officials met on the 29th of January 2015 to discuss how Glasgow City Council is implementing the early learning and childcare commitment for all eligible children in their area. Uh, there has been ongoing correspondence uh, since this meeting uh, also. Uh, in addition, the First Minister met fair funding for her kids on 9th of January 2015 and has written to them this week in relation to their three suggestions. Bob Doris. I thank the Cabinet Secretary for that answer. Following a number of meetings I have had with fair funding for our kids also, I have made a number of representations to Glasgow City Council over the need to develop more full-time nursery places, additional full-day provision and extended partnership nursery provision in order to make sure every child's right to childcare is both practical and as accessible as possible. Can I ask the Scottish Government how it would seek to work with Glasgow City Council in this area and, more significantly, to monitor real progress being made to make sure that places are available at the right place at the right time so that parents that I represent can actually access the provision that they have been promised. Cabinet Secretary. Uh, thank Mr uh, Doris for his uh, question. The Scottish Government will be more than happy to work with uh, all local authorities, and that includes uh, Glasgow City Council, um, about how we can work together uh, to build our shared ambition uh, for high quality childcare, uh, flexible childcare, and also the, the plans that we all have uh, to expand on uh, childcare uh, provision. Uh, and that's an ongoing di dialogue with all our partners. Uh, in local government and can I assure uh, Mr Doris and others that we're happy to take that forward. Cara Hilton. Yeah, um, given the evidence that across Scotland thousands of three and four year olds are missing out in their free childcare place, will the Cabinet Secretary commit to an urgent review to identify the full extent of the problem and could in, include an accurate take up rate? And does she agree that this crucial national policy requires national oversight to ensure that every single child receives the free, the free childcare they're entitled to? Cabinet Secretary. So, you know, so I think Ms Hilton uh, really overstates her case. Um, we know that the uh, take-up rate uh, of statutory uh, early learning and childcare is very, very high in Scotland. In fact, it's near uh, universal levels. Now, that doesn't mean that there isn't uh, some local uh, variation, and it most certainly doesn't mean that there are not families out there uh, with particular needs who are not able to access uh, what is needed uh, for their, their family. As I indicated in my, my reply to uh, Mr Doris, um, the Government and the First Minister has responded to uh, the Fair Funding for Our Kids uh, campaign positively to the three suggestions that they made. We welcome uh, those three suggestions uh, and, as I indicated to Mr uh, Doris, uh, that we uh, are more than happy to work with our partners in local government, for example, on how we can develop reciprocal arrangements between local authorities. Uh, the First Minister has also written to the Chief Statistician to see how we can um, improve uh, you know, data collection and sensible use um, of data at that. And, of course, we'll consider the issue of independent oversight also. Question four, Margaret McCulloch. To ask the Scottish Government what progress it is making towards addressing payday lending and gambling in town centres and neighbourhoods. Cabinet Secretary, Alex Neil. Presiding officer, the Scottish Government has implemented the majority of its action plan with other elements ongoing to tackle the spread of payday loan companies selling high interest short term debt. For example, we have ended business rates relief eligibility for the small business bonus for payday lending properties, launched Scotland's financial health service web portal and amended Scottish planning policy. However, specific controls are needed to address concerns about indebtedness and problem gambling. The Smith Commission recommendations and the UK Government's response in this regard fall short of what is needed. The Scottish Government's first priority, therefore, must be to press the UK Government on these matters, as this is by far the most effective way of dealing with these problems. Margaret McCulloch. I thank the Cabinet Secretary for his reply, but even as the SNP were participating in the Smith process, they remained very clear about their intentions to act on the clustering of payday lenders in our high streets with the powers at the disposal of this Parliament. Why is the Smith Agreement now being used as an excuse to delay action on the proliferation of payday lenders, which the Scottish Government promised to take in its action plan? Cabinet Secretary. Can I tell the member that actually we have taken action on the Scottish planning policy, which will deal with clustering, and that's already been announced. Uh, the issue uh, that has arisen is whether there would be any effective use could be made of user classification orders. Our position is very clear. 
if we get, which we are demanding, the powers that were promised in the Smith report, then clearly they are going to be much more effective in dealing with payday lenders and problem gambling than our planning uh, controls on user classification orders. If we don't get the powers that are the most effective, then we will introduce uh, measures to use the UCOs. But as the recent consultation pointed out, in no uncertain terms, that's of limited impact and certainly has nothing like the impact that could be made if we were given the, pro the powers that were promised in the Smith report. Mr. McMillan. Uh, thank you, President Officer. Uh, does the Cabinet Secretary agree with me that the most effective way of actually dealing with the issue of problem gambling in our high streets, particularly regarding the, the issue of the fixed odds betting terminals, is to reduce the, the, the stake from £100 down to £2 per spin, which unfortunately is a power that the Scottish Government don't currently have? Cabinet Secretary. Presiding Officer, I know this has been applied elsewhere or is under consideration in other parts of the UK, and it's certainly something that, uh, had we the powers, we would be looking at. Uh, because clearly problem gambling is a major blight in our society. Question number five, Ian Gray. To ask the Scottish Government what plans it has to publish further details of its attainment fund. Cabinet Secretary, Angela Constance. Signing officer, having identified the first seven local authorities to participate in the £100 million Attainment Scotland Fund, we are now moving into an intense planning phase, uh, working closely with relevant education stakeholders and the participating authorities to develop uh, detailed improvement plans uh, for their particular context. As part of this work, we will identify the necessary resources required and work out allocations on the basis of need. And I will provide further information uh, once those discussions have concluded. Ian Gray. <clears throat> Presiding officer, Parliament should be in, in no doubt that uh, Labour believes this is the key challenge for our schools and we do support uh, the attainment fund. But with eight years to prepare for this and £100 million to spend, does the Cabinet Secretary not think it would have been reasonable to have had in place a strategic plan based on the professional expertise of our teachers, educational best practice, and indeed the aspirations and ambitions of parents? Isn't she rather making this up as she goes along? Cabinet Secretary. Well, I think it's Mr Gray who's playing catch-up here, and I think it's Mr Gray and the Labour Party who quite clearly are emulating the Scottish Government's plans for education. And if you look at, for example, for example Jim Order. Murphy's press release at the end of February, it's quite clear that he backs our plans for an attainment fund. It's quite clear that he backs our plans for improving reporting and making progress on closing uh, the attainment gap. And that Labour also back our plans for enshrining in law uh, the chief education uh, officer role. I think it's Labour uh, who are playing catch up, presiding officer. And I'm very glad uh, that they're emulating our, our plans. Question yeah. 6, Graham Day. Thank you. To ask the Scottish Government whether it has responded to the EU consultation on the impact of the use of endocrine disruptors in farming. Cabinet Secretary Richard Lockhead. The DEFRA reply to the, the, DEFRA reply to the recent European consultation reflected views from across uh, the UK. The response highlights the need to protect human health and the environment through a process which is proportionate and would take account of the nature of what is referred to as endocrine disruptor. European pesticide legislation has added an extra tier of assessment on the basis of hazard as well as the risk factors that pesticides pose. So whilst it's vital that pesticides continue to be properly assessed and they should only be used if they do not present a risk to human and animal health or the environment, any assessment needs to be proportionate and evidence-based. Graham Day. Answer. Um, there is undoubtedly reason to limit the use of endocrine disruptors, but responsible soft fruit growers in my constituency are already only using these as a last resort and confining usage to within polytunnel environments. Will the Cabinet Secretary, in whatever case he is making on the issue, highlight this alongside the predicted impact on crop yield, which, depending on whichever the scenario is being consulted upon as implemented, would, according to the Agriculture Horticulture Development Board, result in losses ranging from 40 per cent all the way up to 89 per cent. Cabinet Secretary. I certainly recognise very serious concerns being expressed by Scotland's very valuable soft fruit sector. And I should say that the, the Scottish Government is meeting with our Farmers Union and the Agricultural Industries Confederation and the Crop Protection Association in April to discuss many of these concerns and the issues that are being posed to Scotland. 
I should also say that the government has also asked experts in the science and advice for Scottish Agricultural Agency, known as SASA, and also experts in the rural college to identify what the potential risks are for Scottish crops and what the alternatives might be that could be used by our farmers. So I do very much recognise that this is a, an important debate and could have ramifications for Scottish crop production. Question 7, David Stewart. The Scottish Government, what appraisal is made of the economic impact in the Highlands and Islands of the oil and gas sector? Minister, Fergus Ewing. Presiding officer, Highlands and Islands Enterprise account manage 100 oil and gas companies and invested around £10 million in 2014 in 23 companies active in oil and gas, levering in a further £58 million from the private sector with the potential to create 1,400 new jobs and an estimated increase in turnover totalling £216 million across the region. I also co-chair the Energy North Oil and Gas Task Force that brings together industry and the public sector to maximise opportunities for oil and gas companies in the Highlands and Islands. David Stewart. Thank you, President Officer. Does the Minister share my view that the Arnish Fabrication Yard, with its skilled staff, its deep water and land to develop, could be the ideal location for the newly announced Wave Energy Scotland posts and a facility to carry out future oil rig decommissioning? Minister. Uh, well, first of all, I, I think it should be understood that the, the most important thing is to avoid the premature cessation of production in our oil and gas fields, and that is a primary uh, responsibility because premature cessation of production means an end of the jobs and business that flow from oil and gas developments and also an end to the tax revenue, the hundreds of billions of pounds that flow therefrom. However, Mr Stewart is absolutely right that decommissioning does present an opportunity uh, and I suspect, like himself, I visited the Arnish Yard, worked closely with John Robertson and Bifab and certainly I would expect that that company will uh, wish to play a part in the decommissioning opportunity. So far as the second part of his question is concerned of Wave Energy Scotland, I'm proud that the Scottish Government has announced funding of £14.3 million, the largest ever in marine energy, and I think the benefits of that investment will be felt uh, across the Highlands and Islands, in Orkney, in uh, Inverness, where the core staff will be based, and also in the Western Isles. And I'm very happy to continue to work with the member on all these matters. Question 8, Rob Gibson. Thank you, President Officer. To ask the Scottish Government how much private and public land in Scotland was registered on the national map-based register of land ownership by December 2014 and how much it envisages uh, being registered in the next five years. Minister, Fergus Schoening. At December 2014, just over 58% of titles and 27% of land had entered the land register. Information whether owners are public, private or third sector bodies is not recorded. Ministers have invited the Keeper to complete the land register, presiding officer, over the next 10 years and to register all public land over the next five. Rob Gibson. Uh, thank you for the answer. Only 24% of the land holdings in Ross and Cromarty have been mapped in the register, as I understand, last year. Progress painfully slow. What resources can be made available to speed this process up uh, to achieve the targets the Minister has mentioned? Particularly, uh, could he comment on whether there should be higher registration fees for large estates or uh, some means to employ more people in the registers of Scotland? Minister. Well, I have every confidence in the Keeper and our staff as having the capacity and the professional skills uh, sufficient to meet the task with which they have been charged by the Scottish Government to complete the land register over the next decade and register all public land over the next five. Uh, we have adopted, I think, the carrot rather than the stick approach by offering incentives uh, or potential incentives for voluntary registration. That is being considered. And we also work with all parties, public bodies and landowners to uh, encourage landowners to make voluntary registration of their, uh, of their holdings. And also we will be requiring uh, public bodies to register the land. So that is something that they will be doing. Thank you. That ends general questions. Before we move to the next item of business, members will wish to join me in welcome to the gallery His Excellency the Right Honourable Sir Lockwood Smith, the High Commissioner of New Zealand. Thank you. We now move to first.